Okay, so earlier I said that uh, there are, you know, two really, really important chemical concepts, chemical things for life. And one of them we've already talked about, and that's water. We talked about how water is the basis of all life and that it's really the ability of water to form these strong polar hydrogen bonds that allows for its life-giving properties. Uh, the other really important chemical concept behind life is carbon. And what makes carbon special is that it, so let me draw a carbon here, all right? So carbon is number six on the periodic table. So it has two electrons in its inner shell. Remember that first shell has uh, two electrons in it. And then in the next shell, it has four electrons. Remember, it wants to get to eight. So it wants a full outer shell. It's not particularly close to either end. You know, it'd have to gain four or lose four. So it's not going to play the whole steal or lose some electrons game. It's just not close enough. So it's very much going to share electrons. It's going to make covalent bonds. And because it has four electrons and it needs four more electrons, that means that carbon can make four bonds. So it can bond to four different things. Uh, another thing is that carbon is not very electronegative. Like, it's not super weak in terms of electronegativity, but it's not very strong in terms of electronegativity. It's very middle of the road. Now, things that are very electronegative don't like to bond to other things that are very electronegative. You put two oxygens and bond them together and they're both gonna be fighting over the electron because they're both very electron grabby. But carbon likes to share. And so it can bond with lots of other things. And one of the things that it likes to bond with is other carbon molecules. So you can have a carbon bonded to a carbon bonded to a carbon, which is then bonded to another carbon. And maybe this carbon up here has got three carbons hanging off of it. And this one up here has got another carbon this one down here has two carbons hanging off of them. And because carbon can bond to four things and it can bond to other carbons, it can make these really big, complicated molecules. And you see what we get here is what's called a carbon backbone or a carbon skeleton, where you can have these huge molecules of uh, that are made of carbons bonded to other carbons, bonded to other carbons, bonded to other carbons. And then we can start throwing in some other things hanging off of the carbon backbone. So let's, you know, maybe we'll have an, a hydrogen here. Maybe we'll have a hydroxyl group here. Maybe hanging off of here, we'll have an N uh, with some H's attached to it. Maybe this carbon is like double bonded to an oxygen and then has an OH coming off of there. It's called a carboxylic acid. You know, maybe this has got, you know, three hydrogens on it. And so you can start to have these big carbon backbones that have lots of things hanging off of them. Those things that are hanging off of the carbon backbone are called functional groups. They're what actually gives large molecules, molecules of life, their ability to do things. But it's the carbon that gives them the ability to be large, complicated molecules. These, by the way, are called organic molecules. And the science 
of carbons bonded to other carbons is called organic chemistry. That's all organic means. It doesn't have anything to do with natural or fresh or anything like that. All organic means is that it involves carbons bonded to other carbons. This is one of my big pet peeves with like the organic food movement and things like that. I'm fine with the movement, the whole like not using pesticides things and sustainable growth and all of that. That's all fine. I hate the name. It's a stupid name because organic just means carbons bonded to other carbons and all food contains carbons bonded to other carbons. Like all food contains carbon compounds. So it's all organic food. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. So let's get off that soapbox thing. So organic chemistry here is the study of compounds containing carbon and specifically containing carbons bonded to other carbons. We're not talking about like carbon dioxide here, but you know, ethane, butane, propane, things like that. Now, there are many, 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 many different classes of organic compounds, of carbon compounds, but there are four that are going to be really important for us in our study of biology. And these are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Those are called the four biological macromolecules. Macro means big. Remember I said that the thing about carbon compounds is that you can get them to be really big and complicated, and that means that they can start doing complicated things. Um, so this is just basically reiterating what I said. Um, carbon has four valence electrons. Those are those outer shell electrons, meaning they combined with four different things. And carbon binds with other carbon to form these carbon backbones or carbon skeletons. And you can then have things, functional groups, hanging off of those carbon backbones. There are some common motifs that you might see in carbon backbones. So for instance, carbon backbones can be linear and they can be of different lengths. This is a two carbon carbon backbone that is uh, called ethane or ethane. Um, this is a three carbon backbone. That would be propane. Um, usually meth means one carbon, eth, two carbons. Prop is three carbons, carbons. But is four car, er, is, uh, yeah, but is, uh, four carbons. Pent is five, hex is six, and then up and up and up. Uh, carbon backbones can have, um, single bonds between the carbons. If it ends in the term ane, like propane, then that means that it is all single bonds. It can also have double bonds between the carbons. If it ends in ene, so for instance, this is butene. Ene means that it has at least one double bond. And uh, the double bond is named for which carbons it, it is. So these are both butenes, but this one here would be called 1-butene because this first carbon has the double bond, and this would be called 2-butene because it's the second carbon that has the double bond. Uh, once you get past, like, th uh, three in length, you can have carbon compounds that are linear or branched. Now, carbon compounds are named for the longest stretch of carbons. So this would be butane. And this would be 
uh, uh, isobutane, meaning it's a uh, an isomer, same formula but different structure than butane, or it would be one methyl propane, or sorry, two methyl propane, meaning that it has a one carbon chain coming off of the second carbon in the longest stretch, which is three carbons long. You don't have to memorize all that, at least not until you get into organic chemistry. Uh, carbon compounds can also be either ended, open structures. So like this is an open structure because it's got two ends. This is an open structure. It's got three ends. This is a cyclical structure or a ring structure that folds back on itself. So these are the basics of carbon backbones, and they can be combined in all sorts of different ways. Uh, like I said, there are functional groups that hang off of these carbon backbones. Carbon by itself is not chemically very interesting. Uh, its most interesting property is that it can bond to other carbons and that it can um, bond to four things. But that's not what's going to be super important for doing chemistry in the body. Most of the chemistry in the body is going to be done by functional groups that are hanging off of that carbon backbone. I like to think of them as like the carbon backbone is like the Christmas tree and the functional groups are like the ornaments that are hanging off of the Christmas tree. All right. And you can have a whole bunch of different types of ornaments that do all sorts of different things. They aren't any useful, they aren't useful if you don't have a tree to hang them off of, but the tree by itself is kind of boring. Two common examples of functional groups that we've talked about already are hydroxyl groups, OH. These are polar hydrogen bond forming groups. Carbon by itself is fairly hydrophobic. It is non-polar. Um, but you start sticking some hydroxyl groups on it, and it becomes very polar and capable of forming hydrogen bonds. Another is what's called a carboxyl group, or a carboxylic acid. Now, I know that it looks like it says COOH, and so you might think, that it is shaped like a C bonded to an O, bonded to an O, bonded to an H, and then something else coming off of that C. But that is not correct, right? Which you can tell because this carbon here only had two bonds coming off of it. The COOH is actually you have a, something bonded to a carbon. That carbon is then double bonded to an oxygen. And then it's single bonded to a hydroxyl group. Um, so here's our C, O, O, H. And this carboxyl group is important. It's called a carboxylic acid, and as you might guess, it has an acidic pH. This oxygen is very electronegative, and it pulls electrons away from the carbon, making the carbon positively charged. Its positive charge now pulls electrons away from that oxygen, Oxygen really doesn't like having electrons pulled away from it, so it's going to pull even harder at the electrons from that hydrogen. The hydrogen doesn't have anything else to pull against. It's just losing its electrons, and when it doesn't get enough time with the electron, it is more likely to go its own way and just leave. We know that proton donors are acids. Uh, a lot of biological macromolecules have many functional groups, not just one. Here are some examples of functional groups um, and their properties, and I'm going to go more into detail with them 
on uh, the next page. Uh, the ones that we're going to be talking about are the um, hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, sulfhydryl, phosphate, and methyl groups. These are the groups that I will expect you to know and know the properties of. First off, we have hydroxyl. I already told you about hydroxyl. It's an OH, as you see right here. Uh, might sometimes also be written HO, depends on which direction it's coming out of. Uh, the technical name for this compound, other than being a hydroxyl, is an alcohol. Things that have this group are called alcohol compounds. Um, here's an example here. This is ethanol. Ethanol is, uh, you know, it's, it's what we think of as drinking alcohol. It's the alcohol that you would find in wine or beer or something like that. Remember, eth means two carbons. An or ane means all single bonds, and all means that it's an alcohol. It's got an OH group. So ethanol, two carbons, and an OH group. The properties of hydroxyl groups are that they can form hydrogen bonds, and they are polar. So they are polar and they can form hydrogen bonds. Next, we have the carbonyl group. All right? A carbonyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Carbonyl groups are actually seldom going to be found on their own. They're mostly going to be found as a part of some other group, all right? So uh, a ketone is a carbonyl. You see here, this is a carbonyl that is in between two other carbons. So this here is acetone and... It's got a carbon and two methyl groups on either side. And so uh, and ketones will usually end in the word or the syllable own. And remember that they connect to carbons. Uh, aldehydes are a carbonyl group that has a carbon on one side and a hydrogen on the other. Aldehydes usually end in the suffix al. So this is propanal, prop for three carbons, al, meaning it ends in this aldehyde. The properties of carbonyl groups are that they are slightly polar. They're fairly polar, um, but they do not donate hydrogen bonds. They can receive hydrogen bonds, and that means that they can kind of mix with water. But they can't donate hydrogen bonds. Um, another property of carbonyl groups, which we will see, is that they are chemically reactive and they are particularly found in sugars. Now, if you take a carbonyl group, that's a carbonyl group, and you combine it with a hydroxyl group, you get a carboxyl group or a carboxylic acid. I just told you about these on the last slide. Um, the combination of the carbonyl, which is polar and pulls electrons away from the carbon, 
and the uh, hydroxyl, which is already polar and pulling electrons away from that hydrogen, means that this is a very polar compound. It is acidic, meaning that it can lose that hydrogen. Um, and if it hasn't lost that hydrogen, it can hydrogen bond as well. So these are polar, acidic, and in water, since they usually lose that hydrogen, they become charged, meaning that they are also ionic. Now, amino groups, very similar to OH groups, very similar to hydroxyl groups, they're NH2 groups. So here we have an N bonded to two H's. Um, important features of amino groups. Uh, first off, these NH bonds are polar and protic. So they can both donate and receive hydrogen bonds. So they're polar and hydrogen bond forming. But secondly, this nitrogen here actually has two lone electrons, what's called a lone pair of electrons. And that lone pair of electrons can absorb a hydrogen. So a hydrogen can sort of glom onto it causing this to become N H three and it's gained a proton. So it's gained a positive charge. N H three plus we have a term for things that can absorb hydrogens that are hydrogen ion acceptors, and that is bases. So ammonia or amino groups can act as bases. They are hydrogen bond formers. When they gain a base, they become ionized, um, and that's how they're usually used. Sulfhydryl groups, just like hydroxyl groups are OH, sulfhydryl groups are SH. Um, sulfhydryl groups are a little polar. Sulfur is less electromagnetic, uh, electronegative than oxygen is. So they're a little polar, and they can, in theory form hydrogen bonds, although they tend to form only very weak hydrogen bonds. Actually, the main use of these sulfhydryl, or what are called thiol groups, is that if you get two of them together, they actually can react with each other. So if you have an S, H on one side, and then you have an S, H, on the other side, these two things can become what's called cross-linked, bonding the S's together and letting the H's leave as hydrogen. Um, so these sulfhydryl groups can be used kind of like molecular staples to connect to parts of the same molecule or parts of different molecules together. This process is called cross-linking. And so you should know that sulfhydryl groups are involved in cross-linking. Phosphate groups. Uh, phosphate is the conjugate base of phosphoric acid. And so you can see here that phosphates have uh, a lot of negative charge. They have three 
oxygens, two of which are uh, three single bonded oxygens, two of which are charged because they've actually already lost their hydrogen. Phosphoric acid's a pretty strong acid, so in the body, it's just already lost two of its hydrogens. And it has this one double bonded oxygen. You'll note that this phosphorus has actually more than four bonds, and that means that it has more than eight electrons in its outer shell. It can do that. If you want to know why it can do that, go take chemistry. But for our purposes, just know it can do that. Um, phosphates are highly charged, highly negatively charged, uh, and they can be used to add negative charges to molecules. Um, but more importantly, they are super important linking molecules. So, for instance, you can have one molecule that has a phosphate in it, and then another molecule that ends in an OH, and these two things can react together to form something that is connected by what's called a phosphate or a phosphodiester bond. All right, so phosphates are kind of like um, little hooks that you can use to easily and reversibly hook two molecules together or unhook two molecules from each other. Um, phosphates, when bonded to other phosphates, also have a lot of energy. And we're going to see that this is, is an important property later on. Last, we've got methyl groups. Methyl groups are CH3, meaning that you've attached a carbon with three hydrogens on it. Now, important thing to keep in mind is that carbon and hydrogen have approximately the same electronegativity. So these bonds are going to be non-polar. If you attach a methyl group to something, you've capped it, right? Because the methyl group can't go any further. But you've also made it more non-polar. You've made it more hydrophobic. So if you take a, uh, a molecule and you start attaching a few methyl groups to it, you make it more hydrophobic. That means it will dissolve less in water, but as we'll see later on when we talk about cell membranes, things which are hydrophobic can pass through cell membranes much easier. Um, this is actually one reason why what we call crystal meth is so dangerous. Um, it is amphetamine, which is speed, um, but it's made much, much more dangerous by the addition of this methyl group to it. The methyl group makes it more uh, uh, hydrophobic, so it can cross easier from your blood into your brain. So in am amphetamines, like Ritalin, is an amphetamine. Lots of people take Ritalin for like ADD and stuff like that. You take it and it actually takes a reasonably long time to affect you, and so it affects you slower over a longer period of time. Meth hits your brain much faster because it crosses that barrier much more quickly, and as it crosses that barrier, it can actually do damage. It can knock holes in that barrier, which kills brain cells. So if you look at the brain of somebody who's been a meth addict for a long time, it'll look like Swiss cheese. They've got whole areas of their brain that have been destroyed by these hydrophobic molecules crossing over.